Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCullough. Thanks for joining me. we got a great guest on today. Brendan Ahern is the CIO of Crane Shares. You've probably heard of Crane Shares. Uh, they're one of the big ETF companies that invest in China and emerging markets, uh, some emerging technologies as well. Uh, I met Brendan uh, several years ago in China, in Beijing and Shanghai. We were on a little speaking tour together. I've uh, been admiring him and his company since that time, watched him speak a few times. But we're going to bring him on the show here today. We're going to dive into what's really going on in China. Is it reopening? What about the conflict with the US and China? What about the conflict with China and Taiwan? What about the Russian border along China? And what are the sectors within China we should be looking at right now as great investment opportunities? All that more coming up right now with Brendan Ahern. It's official. Mark Chaikin just went live with the biggest prediction of his career. A new wave of volatility is coming for the stock market and investors need to act immediately. Mark's prediction is based on an indicator that has only triggered a handful of times in the last 72 years with a 100% success rate for predicting where stocks will go next. During Mark's 50 year career, he's worked alongside some of the biggest investors in history including Paul Tudor Jones and Michael Steinhardt. In fact, Mark invented one of Wall Street's most popular indicators for picking stocks, still used by hedge funds, banks, and brokerage sites, and today found in every Bloomberg terminal on the planet. Now, Mark's inviting you to watch his brand new event as he explains exactly what the next wave of volatility will look like and where it will send stocks in the coming weeks. He's even sharing one of his favorite ideas free for those who turn in. He says this idea could create bigger gains than anything he's used his power gauge system for until now by turning the coming market volatility to your advantage. But Mark says you must act today before more volatility hits the market. To watch his newest prediction in full, go to chickenevent2023.com. That's chickenevent2023.com. All right, so here he is, Brendan Ahern, uh, CIO of Crane Shares. Um, and Brendan, I met you for the first, maybe not the first time, but we were both in China. What was that, 2018, 2019, I think, with the Stansberry Conference. Um, and I think you had one of your colleagues there with you as well. And I, I, I know I'm a huge bull on China. I know people hate to hear that a lot of times, but <laughs> and, and listening to you talk, and I saw you speak at other Stansberry Conferences. So uh, thank you so much for joining us and finally you know, getting you on the show and we don't talk as much about China as we should in emerging markets on here. So it's it's uh, really what's going on in the world. Really glad to have you here. Thanks for coming on. No, no. Thanks. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Matt. It's great to reconnect. So let's just jump into it. I mean, obviously, um, I guess the big thing with China right now is they, they've been reopening, the process of reopening. You know, COVID really, obviously, the shutdowns that they had there, we thought it was bad here, but, you know, even worse there. What are you seeing basically on the ground over there right now? How far into the reopening are they? Uh, and you know, is this a process that's going to take a while? Yeah, the, the reopening is 100% happening as we speak. You've got domestic travel is back to pre-pandemic levels. Over the next several weeks, you're going to see a pickup in international travel that will happen incrementally. Um, in terms of just basic consumption, you are seeing a pickup in retail sales, in particular online e-commerce retail sales. So I think I think this idea that you know this massive revenge spending that uh, that I, I'm 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 a little bit more um, definitely constructive on the idea, but I, I think it happens incrementally as their economy comes back online, as you have policy support for consumption, consumer confidence grows. And we'll see that play out over the course of this year. But 100 percent, I think 2023, the year of China's consumer. So obviously you guys have a consumer ETF, a Chinese consumer ETF. Um, I was looking at numbers before that, but I pulled so many up. I don't know if I have that exact one in front of me. But what I did notice, though, uh, Brendan, is um, your, your Internet ETF, KWeb. Yeah. Uh, over the last 12 months of 36 and a half percent versus the S&P down about 5 percent. And yeah, I think that's kind of flying under the radar a little bit because, you know, there has been a, a bit of a risk off trade. It's been kind of risk on recently in the last few months. But that being said, it, 
I didn't realize, and I follow this stuff that yeah, how well yeah. that ETF has done, and what what is driving that? Yeah, yeah, it's been a little bit of a stealth bull market, and 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 I think Canada, you know, we we've got a little bit of a correction or pullback occurring in February and March, really driven not by the balloon, which, which you know, we could talk yeah. about, uh, but but really by the strong dollar that as, as the as global markets realize the Fed is serious about inflation, uh, the dollar is getting quite strong, which has really led to a risk off for, for asset, global assets, including China. But, but, you know, to actually answer your question, Matt, it goes back to in October, you had the party Congress where, you know, you read about President Xi getting his third term, but more importantly for the entirety of the Chinese government, all big issues in China were on the back burner until Xi was confirmed for the third term and he put his people in place to run, run China's government. And so big issues like zero COVID, real estate, and the US-China political relationship, huge amount of stress built into uh, twenty across 2021, 2022. And then at the party Congress, you had big pivots, total 180s on those three issues. You, you know, we talked a little about zero COVID going away, huge amount of policy support geared to the real estate sector. And you had an effort to uh, repair the U.S.-China political relationship uh, that unfortunately the balloon has kind of detracted, I, you know, hopefully just in the short run. And, and that led to this massive uh, rebound in K-Web, which we really do think is a domestic consumption play because of the e-commerce companies in there, the Alibabas and JDs and Pinduo duos and others. Uh, so, so you had this big pivot. And, and so, yeah, I, I think of 100%, I think you know, we're still arguably in a little bit of a, of a bull market from that October low. It just with this against the face of the strong dollar, we've got a little bit of a correction, which we think is actually an opportunity for those investors under allocated to, to take on some, some positions. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, I've always been uh, quite the bull on uh, Chinese uh, internet slash tech stocks. Um, Tencent was a big holding of ours yep. for a long time, and that's the number one holding in K Web here, obviously. Um, and uh, I, I, I agree with you too. And if you look at the valuations comparable to um, their their peers in the U.S., obviously they're always traded at a bit of a discount, but this yep. well way too discounted, in my opinion. Uh, obviously, built off fear of China. Um, and speaking of fear of China. You know, obviously, you, you you're there often, and you, and you kind of probably have a really good view of what's going on politically versus the talking heads that just spout you know, spew out all kinds of stuff. How do you view the situation now? I mean, you can go as far as like Gordon Chang talking about World War Three with China um, to people that say, you know, it's fine. We kind of you know just have this back and forth, two bullies going at it. What is your view on a political uh, stance? Yeah, I think I think you know these two economies are highly intertwined, and and you know you'll read people say, get me, you know. Get me out of Chinese equities. Well, well, that means, you know, almost 20 percent of Apple's revenue comes from China, 25 percent of Tesla, you know, more than 10 percent of Exxon Mobil. So so, you know, you can't you just can't get out of the you know China, per se, because of U.S. as well as global multinationals are doing really well in China, the Nikes and Starbucks. But also, you know, General Motors sold more than two million cars in China last year. Right. Boeing and Caterpillar. So 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 business people are getting along just fine. You know, politicians are not. And, and I think this is a consequence of covid that, you know, business people like, you know, like me, are getting on airplanes and having lunches and dinners with people all over the world. And, and in, in Washington, D.C., people are not getting on airplanes. They're not talking to corporations. They're not visiting China. And, and I think, I think that's, that's, and it takes two to tango, so I'm not pointing the fingers mm -hmm. at, you know, I think both sides are culpable here. Uh, but I think I think the relationship has really suffered because of that lack of human interaction. And that that is what's so disappointing about the timing of the balloon in the beginning of February was you, you had Biden G meet at the G20 that led to more discussions at APAC. It led to Blinken literally was going to get on an airplane that yeah. Saturday and Friday this 
this darn balloon and and it put it on ice and um, hopefully hopefully the two sides can get over some of this acrimony and some of the clickbait apocalysm because you know these it's there's just no upside there's just no upside to current friction and i'm i'm all this bring it back re, you know i'm i'm just so skeptical i'm just very skeptical yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a big theme, though, you know, the kind of, you know, reshoring, you know, anti-globalization, let's bring everything in manufacturing here. Um, you know, I, I don't know the numbers. You probably know as much better than I do. But, you know, depending on what side you listen to, people like, you know, China needs us. But I, I think we kind of need China as well. I think we both need yeah. each other, don't we? I mean, really, there's no global economy without each other. Two largest economies in the world. You one one hundred percent. You know, you know, their economy is highly geared to the West, and you know, yes, you know, they're buying cheap Russian oil. I mean, they have this massive border with Russia. I mean, you know, imagine if the U.S. and Canada had a you know had were acrimonious, and how do you how do you protect that you know a border that big? And the Russia Chinese border is significantly larger, right? And so, so they have to kind of play nice with Russia because of that border. At the same time, their economy is so geared to Europe, to the United States, you know, they cannot afford to be ostracized like a Russia. You know, Russia's got mm. nothing to lose. China has everything to lose. And I think I think that. The, the mutually beneficial nature of that relationship has been lost a little bit in some of this political, you know, barbs that get thrown back and forth. You know, we outsource our pollution to them. You know, you know mm -hmm. we're so lucky that there's people who are so poor that they're willing to process rare earths, yeah. to refine steel. And, and that's true for China. It's true for India. It's true for a lot of the EM world. And, you know, we complain about cardboard straws. And yes, I listen, I, I as a New Yorker, like I'm a huge believer in a, in a strong U.S. defense. Right. It's it's kept another 9-11 from happening here. And, and yet. And so, sure, you know, the, the chips that go into nuclear missiles or national should should be made here. Uh, yeah. But. A lot of this stuff, it's just not coming back. I mean, just mathematically, we're at full employment. You know, there's a hundred million Chinese in manufacturing. You know, you know, you know, do I want my kids in the US version making you know these things? I yeah. don't. <laughs> you know, we are mental, mental manufacturers. Yeah. They are physical. Um, and yeah. I'd rather much rather be in the former, right? Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Um Brendan, you brought up uh, property, real estate. Um, obviously, that, that's been a kind of a rocky ride for the, the real estate sector in China for a while. Where do, you, where do you see a bottom here? Do you see any opportunity in, in that area? Yeah, what, what's interesting is, you know, the Chinese government is, is always thinking about potential crises and trying, you know, if we think about Western regulators, we're always backward looking. Um, and, and they're forward looking, right? Because stability is always job one in China. And they recognize that these levered real estate developers, Evergrande and Country Garden and Sunak, there's a whole host of them, you know, were, had the potential to create a systematic financial risk, you know, a crisis. And, th and they kind of put the screws to those companies, which actually created the crisis. And so the pendulum, like many things, it was too loose, it went too extreme, and now it's coming back in the middle. So, so part of that is they realize, whoa, if, 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 if these developers actually go bankrupt, there's a lot, you know, over 100 Chinese banks are on the hook. You know, you've got 100 a, a wealth management firms, you know, mutual fund families are on the hook. So and then, and then the bigger issue, Matt, is you know something that you you know you probably witnessed in China was the infatuation with real estate investing in China. And uh, you know, you know, and speaking to you know, your producer Greg, you know, my my mom's actually from Denver, where over my lifetime, Denver's just whoop, you know it's just gone outward. It's gotten so big. I remember as a kid driving driving to go see a Colorado Buffalo game and it was farmland between Boulder and Denver. And yeah. that's like every Chinese city. It's just gotten bigger. So, so you got two thirds of household wealth is in property. And so 
They've had to dial back a lot of their putting the screws to this sector because it it actually hurt Chinese households. So, So that's where you're seeing all of this policy support. And we actually think, I mean, that there's an opportunity in the bonds. You know, I think I think there is risk in real estate equities because they're allowing those companies that issue more stocks, more stock to bolster the balance. But the bonds, and and they, you know, we, you know, this is self-serving and highly biased because we have an Asia high yield bond ETF, and and it's a big part of that. And and I just think those bonds have been left for dead. But it's very clear that those real estate companies are basically part of the Chinese government. I, I just don't see them def- allowing an outright default to happen. So how, how was that ETF done uh, recently? Is it held up well? It's it's actually, it's it's done all right. So the ticker is KHYB and um, it's okay. this, this, this has some, uh, uh, you know, of some real risk to it. It's almost more like an equity, you know, you're clipping almost okay. a 10% coupon. But when you look at a chart, it's actually come back quite a bit. Um, and that's driven by, you know, investors realizing, you know, these bonds have you know, really got eviscerated, left for dead. But there is some value there. And so it's actually actively managed. Uh, it's run by Nico Asset Management out of Singapore, where uh, they run a lot of institutional money on behalf of Japanese institutional investors, and they actually sub-advise KYB. So, so they're actually, you know, going doing the credit analysis. And so it's okay. it's not it's different than most ETFs in that it's not passive; it's actually active. So oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I love finding new ideas, especially if it's paying what almost ten percent yield. I mean, that's yeah. that's extremely attractive on itself, right there. You know, I have always believed, you know, the Chinese government, they, they make their, what, five-year plan every, five, obviously, five years, yeah. something like that. Um, and, and, you know, doing my history of the U.S. stock market, I extend over to the Chinese stock market. And I feel like when a government really gets behind something, Brendan, they can really make those stocks go up. You know, when they, when they were building back in the day, was it Anhui, uh, concrete, cement, whatever it is? Yep. I mean, one, that, that stock went up, what, 100x or something like yeah. that over a decade or so. Then you had the internet companies, Tencent, Alibaba, from the bottom that went up, and they, but when they kind of did that, where do you see the government really getting behind in the next five, ten years? Like, is there a certain sector industry you see them getting behind? Yeah, then you know, really, Matt. One of the premise of our founder, you know, Jonathan Crane, in building Crane Shares was you know understanding from living in China that you know this top-down driven economy allows you as an investor to sit on the same side of the table as the government. And uh, it doesn't guarantee success, of course, but it, it you know, certainly we believe increases the odds. So I think I think where you definitively see a lot more effort, I think in the short to medium is the domestic consumption story where I think K-Web is a great okay. play. But I certainly self-reliance that, you know, you know, if you're China and you look at what a lot of people in the U.S. government say about China around semiconductors, you're going to say that's those people are not reliable. Uh, that you know, Qualcomm, Nvidia, Applied Materials, KLA, you know, we need our own version. So, so I think you we see a definitive opportunity in owning Chinese semiconductor companies, which will get a lot of policy support. Some of this is even the Chinese diversifying away from Taiwanese suppliers like a TSMC. Eighty percent of their chips actually are imported from Taiwan. Um, you know, this is this is the high grade chip. So so yep. self-reliance is going to be key. And I think you will continue to see clean energy that you know, they want. They want to try to reduce the effect of pollution uh, through clean technology, EV, solar, wind. So you the, the, is it ETF that would track that KGRN, the uh, China environment ETF with that check? Basically track the green over there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's okay. you know, you, I think a lot of people, Matt, you know, probably saw Ford did a deal or uh, did a deal recently with this company called CATL, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, people call it cattle just because of the, t- yeah. you know. <laughs> but but it's 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 the largest EV battery maker globally, and and it's listed on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, and you know, KGRN holds that company. We also hold BYD, which has also been in the news that. 
you know, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger bought BYD back in 2009. Okay. And, and that $200 million investment has been one of the all time, you know, it's, it's part of their hall of fame track record. And, and actually more importantly, I think Matt is their patience. They sat on that stock yeah. for 10 years. It did nothing. And, and BYD, the lar- one of the, you know, by the, the number one, you know, people talk about Tesla, BYD makes Tesla look like a rounding error in terms of the number of vehicles they're selling. It's, it's unbelievable. So that that's also play to consumer too, right? I mean, if you're kind of looking at it that way, you know, money staying in there. Um, I remember, you know, obviously the wealthy Chinese, they love luxury. You know, they love the luxury goods. You know, they like the watches and the handbags and all that kind of stuff. Um, I read an article recently, Brendan, about uh, kind of the younger generation uh, of Chinese consumers I'm um, talking about like Anta Sports and some of these other yeah, kind of plays, yeah. kind of the Nike of uh, yeah. China. And it, it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the premise of the article was, you mentioned before, you know, they love Nike, they like, they like Western goods, but a lot of younger Chinese, for whatever reason, or more, I should say not a lot more, are looking at domestic goods that are actually there, kind of, you know, the antisports, the, the Nike of yeah. China, if you will. Do you see that kind of trend happening too, kind of being a little more nationalized? A little bit, you know, yes, on, on two fronts, Matt, and these are great, great observations on your part. One is that, yes, there is some national pride in China and they, they love Nike. They love the NBA. And yet Anta, you know, is, is becoming a competitor. Um, also, it's interesting, you know, the younger generation is far healthier than the older generation in terms of smoking, lifestyle, and, and out of COVID exercise and being outdoors has become like a national, you know, a big, big pastime in China. And so, you know, a lot of investors historically have focused uh, with us, with, with K-Web, you know, because it's kind of like the transmission engines, but we also have K-Buy, which holds the, it's the consumer leaders. So it's actually the Chinese brands that are being bought through like the K-Web companies. And that includes Anta, um, it includes home appliance makers like Medea and Gree. It's the liquor companies like Kichwa Mutai and Wooly Angby. So k is kind of an interesting complement uh, to that, that domestic consumption trend. Like what are they actually buying, just not how are they doing? That's interesting. Looking at chart of K buy, it's actually held up really well compared to some of the other Chinese uh, uh, ETFs. It's actually held up real well. One more topic I want to talk about, and this is I know this sector has not done as well over the last couple of years, but um, an old newsletter of mine, I probably when I was over in China with you, I probably was talking about this. Is the Chinese biotech sector um, was hot for a while? Um, Zai Labs was a Biogene, a couple of trade here in the United yeah. States. Um, and then obviously there's you know the back and forth between the U.S. and China kind of push that to the side. Uh, what what are your guys' views on uh, the healthcare slash biotech area within China now? You know, we still are big believers in this space that I think the pandemic you know exposed that China's what you know really inadequately prepared its healthcare sector, and that's the backdrop of I think the. You know, we're all becoming aware of, you know, China's got a real demographic problem. So they're simply going to, there's going to be more demand just numerically as their population ages. Um, at the same time, I actually do think that the healthcare sector will be part of this uh, population decline solution that, that, you know, people just kind of feel like China's just, it's going to be half the, half the size in 100 years. I'm not going to be around to verify this claim, but um, I don't think it will. That I think I think the government is going to do something to incentivize um, childbirth in China. We're seeing beta tests in a number of Chinese cities where like in, in the city of Shenzhen, if you have a third child, they actually pay you money. Um, in another Chinese city, they're actually testing that. If you have more than two children, they're, they'll actually pay for the education. So, so they're, they're trying to figure out what actually works, which actually incentivizes uh, couples to have children. Um, I actually think the real estate sector is a big part of that, that, you know, highly urbanized cities like a New York or Milan or Tokyo or, 
it's it's hard to have a bunch of kids if you live in a two bedroom yeah. apartment. So I actually think you know you if you own these real estate developers, force them to build four bedroom apartments and give them away to families that have more than two kids. Probably solves you know, yeah solve the problem. And one thing about the Chinese government is they tend to look ahead. They they think big picture. They're not as short sighted as uh, the U.S. government it tends to be a lot of times. Where yeah. you know they they obviously know population is going to be de declining. They don't want to lose the power of becoming potentially number one economy in the world by due to lack of population growth or population decline. So yeah, I could see them definitely pushing that forward at some point. Um, any other trends that I'm missing uh, within China now that that people should know about, Brennan? I think I think yeah. I mean, you've asked some great questions. You've covered the really the big ones. Uh, you know, I think I think you know for us, uh, you know, Taiwan usually comes up, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it's not really a trend per se, but you know, certainly, um, you know, Taiwan, you know, was based, you know, you know that issue. We we've always felt China plays the long game. That uh, it's just it's not you know it's not worth the sacrifice uh, to take it militarily especially in a you know post russia ukraine invasion the economic consequence of military action you know, i think the biggest risk is the us pushes china into a situation that forces them to react um and certainly the taiwanese people i don't think want that either right you know yeah you know the us politicians fly over there and do a photo app it's the Taiwanese people are on the hook for what actually happens. So, <laughs> um, so I think hopefully cooler heads prevail there, and and just hopefully, yeah, hopefully politicians can take us take a page from from you know U.S. and global multinationals, from Chinese business people. You know, we're getting along just great. You know, what's what's wrong with these polit? You know, why why can't politicians do the same? <laughs> That's the million dollar question. <laughs> if we could answer that, we'd, we'd be you sitting on an island somewhere hanging out. Yeah. Get into that. <laughs> for sure. um, before I let you go, Brendan, I ask every guest and you can answer it any way you want. Uh, I call it the island question, a little setup there that if I were to send you family and friends anywhere you wanted remote island though for 10 years, um, what's the one trend, the investment, the one stock, I assume watch crane shares ETF. What's the one that you really just you feel really strong in for the next 10 years? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, these, uh, you know, our crane shares ETFs are almost like my kids. You know, I love them all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the end, the end reality is that China is not going away. And, and, and as a U.S. or global investor, you have implied exposure through U.S. and global multinationals to China. It's, it's also about finding those local companies that are going to benefit as well. So, you know, I think domestic consumption will just be such a big trend for China over the next 10 years. And, you know, some, you know, maybe owning a little bit of K-Web and K-Buy um, mm -hmm. is, is a way to play, you know, you know, how they do it. And then what do they actually buy? So I'm a big believer um, in the very long run. You know, part of what, you know, my, my background is more on the passive investing space. And, and I kind of joke with people. I say, you know, what's, you know, what's your favorite book or what's, and, and, you know, people will say, uh, you know, Ben Graham or, you know, Peter Lynch or, you know, uh, Market Wizards. But to me, yeah. the most important finance book is, you know, MSCI's Global Investable Market Index Methodology, because, that book dictates how 16 trillion of active and passive assets are invested. Like MSCI creates the rules and, you know, you know, the big asset managers on their ETFs or index funds, they don't decide who, what they buy or sell the yeah. index providers <laughs> do. And so um, I think in the long run, you know, you're going to have a lot, you know, the China's capital markets have been, you know, it's 3.6% of um, MSCI all country world. The U.S. is 60%. And I, I'm not wow. saying it's going to go like this. It's, you know, yep. but, but it's just, you know, you're going to have a little, little tweak there. And, you know, I think it's a, a great opportunity in the long run. You got a volatility adjusted, right? Emerging market investing mm -hmm. is volatile. Yeah. So when, when real quick before they go, when say that even goes up to seven point two percent, that's a double of exposure to China and still obviously extremely low. Do they go after, from what you've seen in the past, certain sectors when they expand that, or that's basically they try to cover a whole country? 
They're, they're looking at really free float market cap. Um, you know, one thing to be on the lookout, we probably won't find out until May or June, but in technically South Korea is now a developed country, you know, that they use GDP per capita. So, so if South Korea actually gets upgraded out of EM, that means, you know, that, you know, China's a big beneficiary, but it's really about, you know, you know, if you think about China, there's, you know, the offshore markets, so Hong Kong, US ADRs, it's really, what do foreigners think about China? And that's why, you know, KBA, you know, it's yeah. up and down. And then you have onshore China, the Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange, you know, that's 90, 95% owned by investors in China. And you know, KBAs are MSCI China A. And you'll see those two things look very different. Uh, yeah. Because what the Chinese think about China versus what foreigners think can be night and day. So it's really about more of these Shenzhen and Shanghai stocks being added to MSCI indices that they're they're they've been they're very underrepresented. And, and it's not going to happen today or, you know, but in 10, 10 years, five, you know, mm -hmm. You're going to see those Chinese A shares, the kind of stocks within KBA get added to MSCI indices, and that that increases China's weight. Uh, that'll get it from that 3.6 to you know 7.2. Yeah, and still a long way to go, in my opinion. Yep. But well, thank you so much. I mean, so many great insights. I could talk your ear off about China for probably two days, but uh, but you know, really appreciate you coming on, and then uh, we'd love to get you back on again soon, especially. Who knows what the hell happens with Chinese relations here and, and you know what continues to happen with the reopening. But I think it's a it's a big long term story. And uh, I hope everybody goes and checks out Crane Shares ETFs because I, I love them. I th think they're a great addition, a very nice way to diversify a portfolio. Uh, now that's probably too domestic. No, th thank you so much. And yeah, any anytime we can be a resource, Matt, you know, uh, we're always available. That's great. All right, Brendan, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Likewise. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.